Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 620, that's 620 of the Agostino Zynga show, hope you are well wherever this podcast may be finding you, I hope you are doing A-OK, how am I, you know how it is, nice and iry, yesterday was actually my first day back in the gym after taking a whole week off, I guess I kind of did it subconsciously because of the toll my body, well, the, the toll I took on my body with working out every single day during sober October. So I needed that break and it was very well welcomed. I'm not going to lie. I, I feel really good, really fresh and I'm even ready to run later tomorrow. So you'll probably get an update on that because I haven't been running in a very, very long time. I used to live in run like what, three miles uh, yeah three miles probably every three days yeah no sorry three miles three times a week usually um sometimes at my real peak i was like aiming to get at least like 20 miles a week which was pretty nuts if you think about it because i do absolutely zero running now and it's no coincidence when i'm doing zero running that i'm not able to fit in all my flipping comedy gas and recurrence but if you actually want to be slender and not be a flipping unit like i am at the moment the only way to do it is to run loads, but running loads is way harder than going to the gym. I don't care what anyone says. Going to the gym, lifting weights, push, you know, doing dumbbells, pushing, pressing, lifting, back squatting, cool. I think there is some weird gratification with that also because you start off incredibly weak when you first go to the gym then you slowly build up and you see the improvements but with running you know what improvements do you see you see maybe you shaved a couple of seconds off your 5k time Ooh, amazing you're not going to go to the flipping olympics are you so this doesn't really give you any kind of confidence or it doesn't give you any kind of encouragement that you're actually getting closer to any kind of goal because you might get slimmer you it might be a bit um, easier for you to run it might not be as hard on the body or the joints but effectively the times really don't improve that much so you legitimately have to fall in love with it for the mental clarity that it gives you and I did find a lot of mental clarity with it I always found whenever I was super stressed I would kind of um, subconsciously or inadvertently um, go out and run without really realizing it I'd go out and run and kind of quote unquote clear my head I wouldn't say it to myself of course because that's incredibly lame say I'm going to clear my head is up there with announcing you're going to quit social media well i've seen that obviously featured recently that chunks guy who's like an um, influencer and a comedian online got into a bit of trouble because i guess because he's a um because he's muslim i'm assuming for the most part that probably probably the most um issue people had with it because he's muslim and i guess he's somebody that's known for his faith and maybe somebody that's incredibly dedicated to that religion or whatever the term is i don't know what you call it if you're dedicated and you care a lot and you go to the mosque all the time i guess people have you know one image of him and they put him up they put him in a particular level and i guess when they see him hanging around with little nas -esque, a person who legitimately was what twerking on the devil and stuff and making satan shoes and whatnot clearly that's nothing that they don't really ascribe by but i think the main reason why they don't like him is because he's gay so everybody went at him and started attacking this chunked guy because he was hanging out with um little Nas X. I don't think he was even hanging. Was he hanging out with him? Was it his house or was it um um I speed um speed's house? I'm not too sure what whose crib it was. But regardless, it was someone's house. Um the picture was speed, chunks, and um little Nas X just hanging out and the internet went crazy and then the chunks guy, you know, couldn't handle the backlash and the questions and the criticism and decided to announce that he's taking a break from social media, which means nothing. A break basically means I'm not going to touch my phone for six hours because he'll be back. Either he's already back today, he'll be back tomorrow. Yeah, there is no such thing as breaks on social, especially if you're someone like him who your whole career, your whole person, your whole persona, everything is basically, um, you know, it's basically resting on how you present yourself online. So that's not going to happen. But for me, I just have an issue with people who announce things like that. I just think it's incredibly lame. It's up there with people who post up the confirmation email of them getting into the London Marathon, of them running the Hackney Half, of them going to the Berlin Half Marathon, the Birmingham, whatever. All this is like, you haven't run the race yet and you're already trying to get some sort of dopamine hit. You already tried to get to some sort of, um, you know, satisfaction from the fact that you just signed up and paid your money to go and run a race. 
the actual running of the race and the finishing of the race is the achievement not the signing up for it but people want clout and want attention so bad that they'll post up the same thing you see people posting up you know i've got some friends or some people that i follow online from like school days who will sometimes even post up their boarding pass right sometimes they obviously take away some of the personal details but in terms of like oh i'm going away much needed break can't wait and it's like weeks and sometimes months in advance and you're like come on man get over yourself relax take it easy actually wait bide your time and then go on your go on holiday spam the feed with as many pictures as you want but you know basically you know subjecting us to post of your flipping boarding pass is just too much i can't be having that really personally i can't be having that but again what can you do so let's see maybe this chunks guy will recover from it but i just think it's hilarious as well you you should know if you're a um what do you call it if you're somebody that is somewhat religious you should know the reaction you're going to get if you pose with little nas x you should know given his notoriety and whatnot and given his sexual orientation you should know what you're going to get and maybe you're doing it because you want to get that attention but then when it kind of hits you you know it kind of maybe doesn't go the way you like it to go maybe people have been a bit extra you suddenly start to cry foul and i'm going to take a break from social just take a break don't announce it to us we really don't care um for the most part um, i know i don't anyway because just don't care because i think you know it's probably done as a way to kind of um stem the hate that he was getting like to calm down the trolls hey sorry guys i'm really upset now i'm gonna go and think about this and get off social media so they can feel guilty about maybe saying some mean stuff to him but in general he probably shouldn't have posted the picture in the first place if you're gonna post it anticipate the blow back and just take it in your lap or whatever on your route whatever that term is um but yeah let's move on so I'm going to touch upon this. This is an article featured from Hypebeast that I feel like touches on what I mentioned earlier in another podcast regarding influencer marketing changing. Does report on business of fashion where essentially they were saying that a lot of influencer marketing agencies are now pitching influencers that have jobs instead of just influencers who just, you know, exist to take pictures for looking around in central London and just trying to get as much free stuff as possible. Now, I guess if you're a brand, if you're a product, if you're a service, if you're a platform, if you're a store, whatever it is that you need an influencer for, you need more bang for your buck. You actually need to see demonstrable and black and white numbers as to how many people this influencer brought to your site, this influencer made, you know, purchased your item, product or service, whatever it may be. So so I get why now there's been a shift in terms of criteria. Now they're looking for influencers that have day jobs who most likely those kind of influencers are the ones who legitimately buy things. They're the ones who go and spend money and to review things. They don't get sent anything ahead of time. And that gives them a far stronger connection with their audience and their audience also trusts them because they know they're buying most of the things that they're reviewing and it's not something that's being sent to them um, by a brand as a part of a PR promotion. So that would make a lot of sense for me. But I also think in general, the whole reason why we're in this place at the moment is because of the economy. But I also feel like in general, influencers essentially messed up the entire industry by just taking any and everything that came across their way. And I think this is a good example, courtesy of Hypebeast. And it features one of the guys who used to be on that YouTube show called Pack. I'm not too sure if it's still running at the moment. I used to see it all the time on my feed. Never clicked it or watched a full video because it looked lame and something that I would never really be into. But overall, I do know that the guys on the show had a very big influence on i'd guess you'd call it men's would you i was called streetwear whatever is it men's fashion was it streetwear whatever it is maybe it's like hipster wear where you you know you put all these kind of wacky clothes on you go for themes it's kind of like a male version of peacock and it feels like right it feels like a male version of a bad b that you see on instagram right they all kind of want to look a little bit hot they all kind of want to look a little bit cool and that's what they kind of go for and i think the show's premise was that they had these guys who are li- who are kind of maybe the same age let's say they're all under 25 and they'd kind of do these challenges about you know finding an outfit in a vintage store for a certain amount maybe styling a friend to look a certain way maybe having a challenge where they make something that kind of thing but the whole premise around it was to do with clothes 
and one of the guys that was featured in it was this guy here called Danny Lomas. I just know his face. I don't really know his name or any sort of details about him personally. So if I do say some things out here out of turn, please forgive me. I'm just talking from the seat of my pants, as you can clearly see. But this is a feature courtesy of Hypebeast and it's a paid advertisement. So, you know, it's maybe not the best example of this sort of stuff, but I thought I'd mention it anyway. And it's a Danny Lomas and Lauro Piana for Hypebeast Soulmates from the Yorkshire's roots. So from his Yorkshire roots to the fantasy of a sun-soaked Riviera, this is how Laura Piana's white soul is with Lomas every step of the way. Incredibly cringe because if I'm not mistaken, this hypey soulmates thing is something that they do in-house where they effectively feature creatives and notable people within the streetwear universe who have a particular relationship to shoes or whatever it may be, hence the term soulmates. And they talk about them and they give their rundown on them. And I guess Laura, Laura Piana, um, who are known for their walls and stuff, I'm pretty sure the same people, right? They make that kind of thing um they are now deciding to branch out into footwear maybe they did it prior i'm not really too sure and they decided a good way to do it was to piggyback off that hype beast souls feature and make that um a piece that kind of ties in together with what they got but obviously it's a paid advertisement as you can see here presented by laura piana now me not me personally i think the shoes look absolutely horrible they remind me of that kind of era in the 2000s when a lot of brands were making loafers with like sneaker soles i remember when i went at nike there was a particular sneaker that they had there was like a dress shoe with a nike rejuvenate sole underneath it really horrendous horrible stuff i don't know who was wearing that stuff i know i didn't there's no way i'm wearing a lace-up boot with a sneaker sole on it it's not happening it's either i wear a proper shoe or I wear a proper sneaker none of this kind of hybrid shoe sneaker smart casual nonsense going on in my game but forget that in terms of just what i think and how they look crap i just don't think these are anything that this guy would wear or buy in his own right maybe this outfit tells you one thing but i don't think he'd go out there and see these loro piano loafers that are made of is that cold i don't know what it is and um, with the white sole and think that they look hard i don't think they do and i think in general this is what ruined influencer marketing because this is for sure a project where loro piano reached out to him because he has clout because he has influence because he has followers because he was a notable person on the show and wanted to work together on a project and then him of course probably saw the numbers and maybe saw some other things in terms of creatively maybe be able to choose the colors and the soul and the finishes whatever it may be they kind of thought it would be a good marriage but the the problem is that if i can suss this out that this isn't something danny lomas will be wearing day to day and it's clearly a cash grab then i'm pretty sure his own fans can suss it out also because the shoes for me are legitimately garbaggio like straight in a bin horrendous burn them instantly type of shoes the article from hype is as follows from trading wall in the early 1800s the founding Loro Piana and Co in 1924 under the helm of Pietro Loro Piana the northern Italian brand established itself as a pinnacle of luxury um, earning a reputation for sourcing some of the royal finest materials in the world and using them to create masterpiece of understated elegance <laughs> this is definitely a brand piece because it's the best written thing you've ever seen a hype piece as the brand notes its selection is a global affair cashmere and baby cashmere from goats in Mongolia and inner Mongolia Vicuna from the Andes and extra fine merino wool from the Australia and New Zealand and lotus flower fiber from my Myanmar couple this with the minimal branding and the clientele discerning as the brand itself discerning Loro Piana customers fuck off come on man Loro Piana is basically an Italian Brooks Brothers isn't it? and it's talking about discernible flipping customers you need you guys need to relax um couple this with the minimal branding discernible um, so and clientele discerning as a brand itself you've got a house renowned for offering only the most superlative quality um likewise this week's soulmates participant also prides itself on enjoying the final things in life yeah right dude this guy's 25 years old holy smokes bro either he smokes or drinks a lot or just he just got an old face because this guy's 25 look honestly white people age mad isn't it just the other day i found out that flipping julia fox is 32 she's 32 years old julia fox she looks like she's 40 like if someone told me she was 40 i'd believe it if someone told me she was a really fit um pilates instructor who happened to be 60 i'd believe it also if you told me this guy was 45 i'd believe it he looks like jimmy bullard isn't it like legitimately how is this guy flipping 25 and again forget the age the, you know mocking and whatnot 25 and he's wearing these laura piano um 
um, loafers, really. A cool guy like that that has a nice guitar. I don't know if it's a Gibson or whatever guitars people would use that want to be cool, have, you know, living in a great little flat somewhere in London with high ceilings and shit and nice wood floors. Do you really think someone as cool looking as that is really a fan of these flipping loafers? That's the issue with influencer marketing. Influencers are too willing and happy to take things just because someone's paying them, but then it diminishes and it hurts their brand and people stop believing and trusting them for their recommendations because they just think everything's a flipping shill and everything's a cash grab it continues Danny Lomas is 25 from the sleepy English market town of Derryfield in Yorkshire. I don't even know what the hell that is. He doesn't scream Monaco yacht parties, the Riviera. Sorry, it doesn't scream Monaco yacht parties, the Riviera, Mediterranean tans and an espresso. Nor does Lomas' uh, current home in Shoreditch, East London. I always say, that, like, has he never had an espresso because he's from flipping um, Yorkshire? What? Um, but through the power of fashion coming up through the pack uh, YouTube channel before launching his own podcast and work with dozens of luxury labels. Bro, how can you be launching your own podcast channel to have all these luxury labels and the first collab you do that maybe I've seen is flipping Laura Piana? Really? And especially on loafers, maybe some clothing and stuff. Cool, but loafers. Lomas has become an undisputed king of. If you know, if you know, if you know, you know. Lux, the <laughs> thing sharply tailored suits, plush knit, vintage watches, working or not, and the overarching penchant for proper good clobber, particularly a pair of loafers or driving shoes. Man, this flipping editorial, this write up is absolutely vomit inducing. This is where Laura Piana comes in. He says Laura Piana is unexpected and surprising. Said Lomas over a pint in his beer at the local pub. Yeah, I'm sure. On his top, um, Laura Piana, Baby Cashmere, um, Haston mock neck in a bold flaxen yellow hue with his feet donning a pair of iconic Laura Piana white sole shoes. <laughs> Honestly, I hope he got the bag. I'm assuming this jumper is part of the collection too, maybe that hat. I hope this kid got the bag. I'm not going to read the entire interview, but I'm going to play this clip and we can see it. But the shoes are absolutely garbage, man. Look at the nice crib he lives in. He lives in this great crib. He creates a podcast on this massive table. Like, do you know what I mean? There's a natural light coming through the windows. He's got a great little library in the background where he lives there. Like, living a good life. And you're flipping, wearing these white, these terrible white soled shoes, brother. Really? Oh, look, you've got the same mics as well. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This can't be life, man. Honestly. I hope he got the bag. I hope they backed up the bag and it's like hundreds of thousands. I really do hope so. But let's see the video and let's see how he's trying to sell this. This lifestyle, right? This this Laura <laughs> Piana lifestyle. Let's see what he's going for here. A good pair of shoes can turn an average outfit great. Whereas a bad pair of shoes can turn a great outfit pretty bad. So treat yourself. Do yourself a favour. Hello, I'm Danny Lomas and welcome to my flat. As long as I can remember, I've just always... Flatwear. Enjoyed shoes and clothes. It's like a pair of loafers, nice like Harrington jacket. I can't believe this nigga's 25 years old, man. Holy shit. I should just be lying about my age, innit, nowadays. Do you think if I said I was 25, people would believe me? If I said, I'm, yeah, I'm 25, a creative in London, London-based creative, 25 years old. <laughs> trying to make my way in the scene, you know, making my way. You know, trying to make connections, trying to hang out with the cool people. Do you think never don't believe me? Getting a good pair of stay pressed trousers or something, like, clothing obviously can give you confidence. Like, if you look great, you feel great. The Throne Fits boys said it best. They said we're in a post-sneaker world. So, yeah, God, I must have about 30 pairs of loafers. I hate that. I hate that. That sounds like a dog whistle to me. Post-sneaker world, return to tailoring. That, for me, is a trigger because everybody in Paris Fashion Week, the kind of the mecca for men's fashion and the mecca for a lot of the streetwear guys who go there and try and probably bang underage models i don't know i'm just throwing out stuff here and joking but that whole place was obviously inundated with streetwear guys with their chrome hearts tops on and jewelry and wearing their flipping expensive dunks and trainers so it probably uh, disturbed and frightened the aristocrats and the socialites over there and they hated it right these fashion people who would usually sit on the front row are now being you know 
have been flung to the back in favor of some guy that's sitting there who owns some sort of flipping agency that's buying up all these brands and stocking them in stores all around the world and he smells like weed and he's covered in tattoos and all that kind of good stuff so i understand these guys saying hey let's start pushing this return to tailor and thing but for me it feels like a dog whistle because it wants to get black and brown faces out of that scene and if you tell me this is a post sneaker flipping world we're living in i also feel like you want to get rid of the black and brown faces because who's legitimately wearing flipping gh bass loafers every single day on a daily come on man you have to be someone of some level of privilege or you have to be somebody that's non non black hole or brown for the most part no real you know normal human being is flipping around the street wearing flipping you know slippery loafers every single day it's a privilege that not a lot of us got especially if you're toiling out there in the flipping construction fields you know what i mean you don't have that luxury so i'm holding the summer walk in the brown corduroy it's a cool clean silhouette so it's shit. great it's so shit come on come on danny man you're better than this brother man i haven't watched the show i don't know much about you but from i remember clips seeing online and how you carry yourself you are better than this brother but i hope you got paid i hope they paid you mad amounts of money because this is garbaggio man really really it's like doing a flipping capsule collections of suits with flipping reebok like reebok's flipping what like smart casual activation project thing and they tap you up to do some flipping double-breasted jackets with flipping buttons with a reebok motif on it or something like really not all good money is good money but hey in this case i hope you did get the p because these shoes are gash it's versatile big sucker for a good corduroy as well to me Laura Piana is very like the Amalfi Coast. Yeah, just driving like <laughs> the Amalfi Coast while he slots in. What's that? Is that um? Is that uh? I feel I've got that book. Here. Is that Robert Green? There might be a Robert Green book here. I think. I think there might be more, like Master Mastery or something, or something along that kind of line. <laughs> it's just like niggas talking about the Amalfi Coast and the flat in Shoreditch. You know, like hilarious. Vintage cars, little coffees, and then. It embodies that lifestyle of understated. He get, gets run over in the middle of the street while filming this. Elegance. It's like you can't be a good pair of shoes. Absolute trash. I don't know how much Laura Piana paid for that, but congratulations regardless, isn't it? If you want to purchase a pair, what's the details on it? So I don't look like I'm just here scathing the shoes for no point. Have they got any shopping details on it? Um, shop the Laura Piana now on the website it's available if you want to google it google it I'm not going to waste any more time on it because those shoes are absolutely gosh moving on I went to quickly highlight this news I thought was pretty cool this is courtesy of Mixmag and it and it um and it's talking about a site that I use quite often to buy tickets for my nights out um, called Ticket Swap. And it says here, Dutch marketplace platform Ticket Swap launches in the UK. Ticket Swap has expanded in the UK, offering customers the opportunity to buy and resell event tickets, which is weird because I've been buying them for a while. So I don't know what they mean. Maybe they mean they're opening an office here. But I've definitely bought many, many tickets, maybe in the hundreds from Ticket Swap being in the UK. That is a safe and easy way to exchange tickets. The company claims to protect people from overpricing and fraud. Despite only just launching in the UK, the platform already has 1.5 million users across Britain and Northern Ireland. Tickets on the concert to day trips are available. Upload to the site with Ticket Swap Limited in the markup of the original sale price at a maximum of 20%. Operating since 2012, the site has also opened up in Sao Paulo, Stockholm, Berlin, Paris. Paris, Madrid, Milan, and Krakow. Hans Uber or Hans Ober, CEO of TicketSwap, said in a statement, we're delighted to formally enter the UK market, having already built a huge community of more than 1.5 deactivated deactivated dedicated live music fans all over from the last years he added it is clear that there's a need for another innovative resale platform in the uk and we look forward to working alongside the most respected and innovative brands in the period's music to get as many fans and his artists to show as they love as possible the thing i really appreciate and love about ticket swap is that it came at the perfect time for me i felt like whenever i stopped buying tickets on facebook was around the same time facebook turned into fraud I don't know if you notice, but every time you try and buy a ticket on Facebook for an event that's sold out, for some reason you get a message from, usually the, the kind of process is, 
there'll be an event page on Facebook for the event that you want to attend. And in the discussion bit of the page, there'll be people posting, hey, I've got tickets for sale, I've got tickets for sale. But for some reason, the majority of the people saying this aren't really people or it's catfish or it's a scam. And it's somebody using a picture of someone, you know, it's usually women. They'll have a picture of like a, a lady with a kid so that you can trust them or some guy with a cat or something, right? And those will be the ones that they try and hustle you from. And usually they've always got an abundance of tickets. It's never just one. It's always like, oh, I've got 25 or I've got 10 or something. And then once you get talking to them, they always want you to send the money first and they want to show the ticket. The one time I did get the scammer to show me a ticket, it was literally just a screenshot that looked like any other ticket. It looked like what you'd find if you typed in ticket template sample or something on Google Images. It looked absolutely horrendous. And I always wondered what happened to facebook in terms of tickets that way i wonder if this is something that happened as a consequence of the pandemic because everybody during lockdown and pandemic didn't have any way to make extra money or maybe some people were completely unemployed so the best way to sort of hustle and to get some peas is to kind of get into the mar into the fraud and scam market and that's why a lot of kind of refund scams happened during the beginning of the pandemic with amazon maybe that's why all the flipping tickets can happen to facebook but regardless um there was a real gap in the market for a place where you could buy tickets and be okay that they're legit because again the process that i used to use if i used to buy one on instagram or twitter would get the person to basically send me a screenshot of the ticket they could blank out the code or whatever they wanted but just so i knew the ticket did exist and you can maybe tell from this background of the phone they're using bloody blah, blah blah that the ticket was somehow legit but you're still taking a chance and it was always a weird one because it felt like you know it's one person that's scamming you having to create a whole entire profile and every time they scam you no, one time they scam you, you're going to get scammed probably once, you'll fall for it. They're going to only hit you for like 20 quid. So it's kind of a weird scam because you have to set up a whole new account and then try and scam somebody else for 20 quid. But you can only do it during the weekends, right? Because that's when most events are happening from like Thursday to Sunday or even Thursday to Saturday only. So it's a real weird scam in that regard. But I really do appreciate it because what you do on there is that all the tickets are listed or are stored on the website so that when you purchase it from somebody who's listing it for sale it automatically gets sent to your email address you don't have to wait for somebody to send it to you you don't have to get you know whatever else it just gets automatically sent to you and then if you're this person selling it like i have once before the money gets deposited in your account within like three to five business days and it works seamlessly honestly i haven't had to email or message anybody at ticket swap i've just used it pretty easily and kind of got going with it so it'll be crazy to it'll be good to see how it develops over the years but i would also like this to kind of be done on sneakers imagine if there was a marketplace existed similar to maybe StockX, where you could buy legit authentic limited edition shoes but the resale was only capped at a certain amount maybe it was 50 percent, maybe it was 20 wherever it may be so that people that actually went to wear the shoes could have a second opportunity to buy them now it didn't it wouldn't mean you'd have massive amounts of stock but it would be like one place where you could go where you could maybe have the chance to purchase something that you had no option or no chance of purchase beforehand i think that'd be a really good option going forward i would love that but the way the sneak industry now is they love to flip in they actually love the chase. They love people kind of thirsting and crying over the shoes. So I doubt that'll happen anytime soon. But I would like to see that implemented in some regard regarding what TicketSwap is doing now. So big up TicketSwap. Hopefully the UK launch goes well and they keep building because like I said before, I'm a big, big fan of the site and I use it all the blimmin' time. Moving on, we have news courtesy of Hypebeast regarding Jound have decided to tease another new balance 990 that they're going to put out um at this point oh, i will say many times actually i feel like all new balance colorways kind of blend into each other i feel like we've seen a variation of this somehow in some place over the years maybe the exact color placement isn't the same but we've definitely seen something similar to this over the years but still regardless of the colors being the same regardless of them absolutely pumping out the, sh the pairs and not really letting us breathe I actually don't mind these. I have to be honest. I actually legitimately do not mind these. They're a sort of, uh, what would you call it? Like a shades of brown for the most part. I would say brown overall, but I think some for some reason this little section here on the mudguard, which is, looks like it might be suede, which is brilliant, or nubuck, is kind of giving like wine or something 
not even wine, like a pinky type colorway, like a peach or a plum. But I do like the entirety of the combination of the colors personally. It looks like they've added some thicker type laces also in these. They look a bit thicker, they look a bit longer also. I'm not sure what the deal is with this because these shoes already look kind of tight you know in terms of lace job you know how these brands are they don't bother at all to kind of relace their flipping shoes and make them presentable but they already look like they're quite tight already as is and you know the laces are super super long so maybe that's a sneak ahead in just justin saunders the guy who rounds jound where he kind of enjoys having the laces long so he can tie them and make some really big bold loops that look good on an SLL camera. Maybe that's the case, but either way, I'm a big fan of these and I am eagerly anticipating them dropping. You know, you can't go wrong with that little jound hit on the insole there. You really, really can't go wrong. So when they do end up coming out, I'm a big fan of them and I'm going to try to cop, but as per usual, it probably won't happen. Um, it says here, the studio is building on its coveted collaboration model, reuniting to drop another sleek 990 for, for version three um iterating iteration following its olive and brown pack um, offering of earlier this year in 2021 john and new bands also teamed up for a popular release of the black and navy expanding its 993 it's 990 sorry version 3 repertoire the canadian label took to instagram to tease a new colorway arriving before the end of the year this time taking back to a simple brown hue the offering sees john the new balance dressed in a mix of colors and olives take a look below but yeah i already said it i gave my opinion i think they absolutely look like fire i'd wear them in an absolute instant and they are very wearable and i actually wonder going forward i wonder if there's ever a scenario where Teddy Santis is doing a pretty decent job at Adidas at them, sorry, Adidas at New Balance at the moment. If he leaves or, you know, whatever else happens, you know, I wonder if they would offer the job to Justin Saunders. I wonder if he's actually take it and put his own brand or his own sort of consultancy stuff with Jan or whatever else he does on hold so that he could work for New Balance because I think he'd be a great hire there. So would flipping Ronnie Fake, even though he's kind of getting on my nerves lately, but I feel like he'd be a good option there also. But yeah. Jound shoes coming soon before the end of the year they say let's wait and see let's wait and see another one i want to quickly mention is that it looks like <laughs> despite everything that's been thrown at them despite every weapon formed against them despite the fact that they've got a horrible reputation with sometimes never sending clothes it looks like anti-social social club is still alive and kicking by all accounts still pushing out product Oh, sorry, and still lining flipping Nick's pockets with all that moolah. So on one hand, I can be happy for him because he's a fellow Nike Talk, you know, sneaker forum alumni like myself and an internet kid who happened to turn it around and figure out a solution for himself that allowed him to basically do the thing that I would love to do, which is essentially get, you know, paid by living a somewhat creative and fun filled life. And he's absolutely done that. But Anti-Social Social Club had a real um, dip, I felt like, in terms of quality, in terms of offering, in terms of appeal. And the fact that he's still running this brand and it's still kind of, it feels like, on autopilot and just doing its thing and sort of dropping, um, I don't know, what feels like AI-generated flipping graphics and pieces. The fact that it still exists, for me, is still a bit of a win. I don't care if it's not that great. I don't care if this logo is basically a bit played out or whatnot. I still think it's pretty, it's pretty darn nice. And again, look at the little details that they don't do. One one loop in the hoodie, like mine on here, is done, and the other one isn't. Just come on, man! It takes two seconds. Just you know, if you're not gonna make any quality or take pay attention to that sort of stuff, um, it's unlikely you're gonna get your stuff in free if, in in time if you end up ordering it. Oh, so I didn't actually describe that picture. What was that? That was like a ski mask. You've got the shysty mask. You've got a snapback hat with then social written on the side. And you've got the overcoat and a camo jacket on the inside. So pretty interesting wares. Not going to lie. A lady here opened a coat, holding a candle cake with three cakes on it. Not sure who ages that, but whoever. Hope you do well. Another person here hanging out. And yeah, just for me, I'm just surprised that the brand is still alive, personally for me. I just had a feeling that it might just die of its own, of natural causes. But the fact that it's still alive and kicking and pumping out collections is pretty impressive, to be fair. It's impossible to hate that this is still a thing, especially when it involves such a cool founder um, as well. That's somebody that I'm a big fan of in terms of Nick. But yeah, it should, 
it's so i'm surprised it's around it is around it's doing pretty well and if you want to purchase some of their new collection you can it's available now on anti-social social clubs oh yeah i think i mentioned a few times on here that i was a bit disappointed with noah's output and with the stuff that we're doing and maybe it had something to do with the designer and founder of noah basically also having to juggle the signing for joy crew and that maybe had led to noah's design maybe falling by the wayside and i have to be honest and put my hands up i think my uh, writing off of noah was a bit premature because it looks like they've absolutely killed and smashed out the park this barber collection or barber collaboration sorry and it's all sold out every single colorway of this barber collaboration that i've just seen is completely sold out despite how expensive it is also and this clearly goes to show that the power of noah is still ring is still true they're still a powerful brand they still know what they're doing they still do, do things can you know very very tastefully and they have an appeal that is just maybe unparalleled now at the moment one of the great things about this snow collaboration that they've done um with barber is that for once for once when you got these classic barber jackets that most of you know and love there isn't like a crazy dumb embroidered logo on the back there's not a crazy dumb screen print of the logo on the left hand sleeve it's all done very 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 tastefully and i think i mentioned it previously on another podcast regarding supreme and how i felt like some of the stuff in supreme has basically aged me out of buying it because i think a lot of it is basically aimed at kids because of the excessive use of the logos but then i also mentioned that i remembered when i used to purchase or buy supreme often a lot of the things i used to buy from supreme even when i was really young was stuff that was minimal in terms of branding but the cut of the jacket or the particular style of the jacket or the t-shirt or the long sleeve or the jersey whatever it may be was so unique that you could only purchase from supreme that's why you purchased it from there so it wasn't necessarily always a case of oh let me purchase it from supreme because it's the best brand or because i want to show off the design or want to show off the label usually the things i purchased you couldn't tell it's supreme until you come really really up close and then you can maybe see a little red port tab um, next to the pocket you might be able to see an embroidered logo next to the sleeve that's tonal but really subtle bits of branding nothing like how they do nowadays where it feels like on every garment there's flipping sup written there or ream written on the side or whatever it may be called there's always some big logo and i think one of the wins for this barber collection for me is that essentially what noah looked like they did was that they went in and basically just updated the classic barber with some modern colorways and added a bit of their branding basically you've got the noah embroidered here i think it's embroidery i'm hoping it is. if it's embroidery this is going to last forever but i definitely think it's embroidery and maybe they've got some detail here on the snot on the metal snaps on the front but that's essentially what they did they just went into barber and just said hey can we update the colors we've always liked to have you know because most guys in street wear and men's wear have always had these aspirations of like oh if i one day have a collaboration i'd love to take like a staple product and just flip it one way maybe i go and you know design an alpha jacket and for once i want to design it with purple instead of having it the conventional green black and navy or maybe gray and i think um, noah did the same thing with with this uh, barber collection instead of going crazy with the design and adding all these bells and whistles let's just work on the classic shape and basically present it in these new fresh colorways um that you wouldn't be able to get anywhere else outside of this collaboration and i feel like they absolutely smashed it out of the park i really really do it looks incredibly cool incredibly clean i think anybody could wear it um obviously the logo here as i mentioned on the pocket on the front pocket is embroidered so that would mean once you wear this bad boy in it's gonna fade it's gonna dent and whatnot but that logo will stay true and it'll actually wear in really really nicely over the years i can definitely ascribe that happening and you know usually um people wear their flipping barbers into the ground you don't really see many people walking around with flipping you know sparkling brand new barbers even people who wear them in the city even like tough you know toughs or even like really poshy kids who go to like private schools or really well-to-do older men whenever you see them in central london driving their dragovers and you know we're having you know and flipping them um, stepping out of the car with a barber on it usually looks like a barber that's been through the wars and that's kind of a sign of uh 
a sign of pride, right? That you've been able to kind of wear this barber in every occasion that it's served you well in every occasion that you've been in. But I absolutely love these. I think they look really, really good. I think the lookbook and editorial that they did with some of their friends and family, the whole, or the feature here on the website looks amazing. Um, I think you got a guy, that guy called there, was his name? Mark Gibson, who's a co-owner of Wilfie and Nell and the Spanid, which are, are Spanid, which I'm guessing are restaurants. You've got a person here called um, Tans... Tansy Kas Kashak, who's the editor in chief of her hotel life in Bushwick, Brooklyn, looking amazing in the purple. <sighs> Looks so good. You got another guy here called Nick Hakim, who's a musician from Widgewood, Queens. You got another person called Lanny Halliday, who's a founder and owner of Brutus a Bake Shop in Bedford, in Brooklyn. Is this lady, um, Brendan Babson's wife. I'm not too sure. Doesn't he have a wife that looks similar? Though? So am I mistaken? Not too sure. But anyway, they look cool. Um, Lou Aponte, who's a drummer for Jesus Peace. Oh, sick. Awesome. He's there wearing wearing a jacket too with combat. So look pretty nice. You've got another guy here who looks like a model. Daniel Emilio Sores, who's an owner of Almentari Flaneur, which is another restaurant, I'm assuming. I'm assuming some sort of place where you get fresh produce, right? He's got a tote bag full of flipping um, weeds and stuff sticking out of his tote bag, which is the ultimate sign of being a hipster. But let's go to the actual lookbook itself on Hypebeast. I think the lookbook was done expertly well. It says it features a 60-40 take on a Supreme, I'm sorry, Barber Supreme, classic uh, beetle jacket with a waxed cotton beetle. Okay, interesting. What's it say in the product listing here? Um, made by Barber exclusively by Noah 64, 60% cotton 40% nylon shield 100% cotton cordray collar 100% cotton tartan lining double ring pull heavy duty zip closure with step front flap um, storm collar and a plastic interior storm cuffs with snap closures bellowed front pockets with snap flaps and drain vents tartan body lining yeah so it's like, it sounds like a classic Barber uh, it literally sounds like they've just updated um, maybe the material choices by making it 60-40 and then obviously the finishes but it's basically a classic bar but nothing else has been added to it no no craziness which is really cool to see for once um, and the lookbook here courtesy of Hypebeast looks great got a couple of dudes just in a boat you know next to a flipping swan you've got another picture here with dudes in a boat you've got the red barber that looks great on this scale actually that looks really nice isn't it very very nice and then you've got another one here with i guess one of those guys that saw his people i'm assuming i guess they're brothers um you got him wearing maybe the brown one and one is a navy one i love the cordray collar also i think that looks pretty cool there's an the orange ones too that looks really nice but yeah the whole collection is really really well done I have to be honest, it all is really, really well done. And I love every single uh, colorway in this in this collection. So much sure I wouldn't have a favorite if I was going to purchase. I don't know which one I would go for first. Maybe it might be orange and then maybe red and green. I don't know, at a stretch. Just because they're colors you would never get, you know, in retail from Flipping Barber. So why not go crazy? And obviously it's showing you the water resistant repellent guest technology that happens on the upper. But... The one thing that's for certain, you cannot purchase this anymore. They're all sold out. I think US prices was about 800 if I'm not mistaken. Was it 800 or my or my bargain? I think it might have been 600 maybe, because the dollar and the pound isn't that far off. So it might have been six. But regardless, five bills and it's all sold out. Every single flipping colorway is gone, which is wild to see. Because like I said before, I was reporting on flipping Noah's demise and saying that maybe they've lost it and maybe they're spreading themselves too thin, blah, blah, blah. And here they come boom you know was it one two three four five six seven eight nine different barbers and each variation of them is sold out that's powerful man and then you've got the other bits of the collection too you've got some cordray pants you've got a six panel duck hat which would never fit my head because i've got a gut gigantor head you've got another one featuring a duck also with a t which I don't, i'm not really a fan of the t-shirts to be honest i think the graphics are kind of weak um but everything else is decent the hat's pretty nice again it won't fit my head the back of the hat's obviously decent um in the in that kind of uh camo type print on there i love everything about it i'm not going to lie the whole thing is pretty pretty nice let's see if the wash bag is still available for 52 pounds is that available oh it is 
A barber wash bag is available for fifth, £150. Sorry, I said £52. It's definitely not 52 155 And it looks pretty cool. But yeah, big up that collection. And big up Noah for proving me wrong. And demonstrating that I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. As per usual. Let's move on from that one. And let's talk about something else I wanted to mention here. Where is it? So... This is a little entry courtesy of RA that I want to quickly talk about because it got me thinking about something I think I may have mentioned previously in another show. And this is regarding their recent RA mix, which is RA number 858. They are fast approaching the 1000 um, RA mix. I wonder who's going to get that illustrious honor. But essentially these mix series, they feature certain DJs and they have these really cool interviews that I really live for. The mixes I usually can kind of go without them, but the interviews are usually really good and really handy because it gives you a snapshot of a DJ's life. It gives you some insight into what they're doing, into how they're prepping for the rest of the year, what they're doing on tour, how they're thinking about approaching maybe other things they're working on, blah, de, blah, blah, blah. But the main thing that I thought that was really um like there was a point that I went to bring up on the pod was the fact that this person I had no idea they existed before RA featured them a person called DJ Voices and the really cool thing that I thought was that they were a DJ one of the residents at this club called Nowadays in New York that I've always wanted to visit and one of the reasons why I wanted to bring this up was that I am a real big believer that I think the resident advisor DJ Paul should make a comeback and I feel like the resident advisor DJ polls, even though in the past they may have been abused or even though in the past they may have caused some division, they may have caused some issues for people in terms of, you know, seeing your number maybe not increase and then maybe seeing you drop down a few times in the ranking and that may be affecting your ability to make money. I think nowadays the fact that there's such variety on the scene and the fact that punters are clearly going out and seeking out interesting parties to attend, um, finding newer DJs to go and follow and be fans of and they're not all going for the standard Marco Carolas um, you know Joseph Capriati or Cipriati however you pronounce his name type people they want some fresh new blood and I was saying before another pod that the, the funny thing about the RA poll for as much as people hated it the actual gem of the RA poll as with all polls on RA during that era was the comments that's what usually was the gem so usually if you if there was maybe a, a controversial um, number of DJs in the list who are maybe too high up for certain people's liking there'd be certain people in the comments who'd basically say hey if you want to hear somebody who's actually good and plays this type of style listen to this person if you want somebody who's an alternative to the other person that you don't want to support here's this person that's basically where you got the recommendations from and I feel like nowadays considering people are so much more willing and open to go to new nights and test out new spaces without it being some big ticket DJ artists I also think those same people will be receptive if they heard somebody who legitimately was good and kind of ticked their boxes with somebody they kind of were a big fan of I think they would and then the other part of it I think also is that the mechanics behind the DJ poll would actually work in their favor because a lot of these places with the exception of some who put their tickets on dice fn or on other platforms but the majority of promoters especially here in london they host all of their parties or promote them all on flipping ra events and obviously it's all kind of you inbuilt with the ticket system and all that sort of malarkey so it would be pretty cool if there was um some ability for the ra comments to come back so that effectively a lot of people could then start mentioning and promoting and you know voting for local acts or people that are maybe not the most famous um, and basically pitching and saying hey I, I didn't really know too much about said person but I saw them play and I thought they were amazing that kind of vibe and I think it would work really well I really really do think it would work but it obviously does require some people's buy-in in terms of being like hey um, there needs to be some sort of com communication or community because at the moment it feels like with RA it's just like a one way conversation they tell you what they think they tell you what you maybe should be considering or looking at or reading but there is no dialogue back and forth obviously when it did happen and they locked off the comments um, RA I remember them saying oh but there's comments still on Twitter there's comments still on RA flipping Instagram and shit but it's like that's not the same you know it isn't there were people who were specifically on the RA comment section because they are only like the conversation on RA because it was quite maybe I won't say elevated but it was a little bit more grown up in terms of the tone and what people were talking about so I don't know man I don't know I just feel like 
it would be cool if there was an RA Pro again. I just feel like nowadays there's so many people who are missing out on so many amazing gigs or missing out on capturing such, you know, a flipping ready and willing audience because no one wants to put the flipping, you know, the comments back on because maybe a couple of people's feelings got hurt. It's just annoying personally for me. But, you know, I understand some part of it. I really, really do. Um, the interview with um, with DJ Voices anyway, um, let's read a little bit here. It says, um, what was your first experience of memory uh, nowadays? It says, my first memory was stepping into the indoor space while it was still under construction. The outdoors had already been open for a bit by that time. This was summer 2017. My earliest memory is that the club would probably be the first Avalon Emerson all night or the first time I, I played there with Working Woman of K-Hand, um, R.I.P., but my most perf my most formative early days memory would have been Fear Parish into D Tiffany, um, New Year's Eve 2018. Wow, what a lineup! It was one of the amazing sets into another with a complete sonic vibe switch and merging of one group of people that had just arrived with another group of people that had been there all night. The moment launched everyone into such silly loose mood that DJ Python led a conga line around the room as the sun poured in through the windows. That was the beginning of nowadays feeling like a living room, feeling like home amazing imagine seeing that in real time wow what role is um what role has the club played in your history as a dj it would be hard to overstate how much nowadays is my part of my history or my story at this point personally and professionally it was my day job so i spent so much of my time thinking about it and being there as a dj is where i found my dj voice apologies for the pun i've um, been the resident since the indoor space opened in 2017 you know lucky for some <laughs> um i initially through my work with the collective working women and then post lockdown reopening my own i've heard my favorite djs play my favorite sets there and i've been lucky enough to play there more times than i can count the crowd is always evolving but the ethos of the space and the network of people that make up our core audience give me confidence and comfort in the booth unlike any anywhere else there is um, this is largely thanks to a general mood of open-mindedness plus contagious enthusiasm for music and experiencing it all together i sense an adventure and risk-taking are really important parts of my dj practice and relationship to music i think that's partly also to do with the punters like i mentioned previously i think there is a lot more people being daring and willing to take a chance especially in the uk where people are obsessed with buying tickets and going to legit events there are more people who are willing to kind of give alternative quote unquote nights and nights that aren't necessarily mainstream and opportunity and i'd love to see it and even if i do nowadays it's such a comfortable space with so many different places to go and sit down it makes me less afraid of people leaving i feel like a bit of a spoil to be honest lastly being connected to a space and thinking about for lack of a better word a community that surrounds it has given me the sense of responsibility that was maybe lacking in my meaningful way in my life before i feel very privileged to have this relationship with nowadays and it makes me want to be accountable for the peers and neighbors um as an artist to think of actions beyond the limits of performance and consider my role in these things like building a sustainable future for dance music in the NYC, our impact on the neighborhoods most of these are frequent at night or sharing access and knowledge as far as I can. So yeah, she sounds like an absolute gent. I wish I would have known about her prior because I think I would have found out about this person prior if the uh, DJ polls existed because I'm sure somebody from New York would have been like, hey, check out DJ Voices. She's flipping amazing. You absolutely love her, blah, 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 blah. But of course it doesn't happen because a small number of people's feelings got hurt and they didn't want to offend anybody. Absolutely annoying. So I went to end on this little nugget, which is courtesy of the Berghain subreddit regarding people recently visiting it and being a little bit put back by the crowd that happens to populate Berghain. And for me, it's been pretty interesting to read some of these reports because they sound a lot like what I was saying a few months back when I went and I kind of got pillared for it I kind of got some you know negative feedback for the stuff I said in terms of me maybe being over going to the Berghain every time that I go to Berlin because I usually go to Berlin maybe like twice a year especially for somebody like myself who's from London it's quite excessive maybe since I go free I think this time I've been four times a year which is pretty pretty OTT but usually whenever I go I spend the entire weekend that I'm there from Friday to Monday basically in Berghain right raving my face off or mostly between the saturday all the way until the monday 
And I think the last time that I went, I wasn't necessarily that impressed. I was kind of put off by the pushiness of the people in the crowd. There was a couple of people who kind of ruined my mood because they decided to try and jump in the queue. And it happens quite often in Bergen, which is really strange because they have such a picky door policy and usually everyone's on their best behavior in the queue. You don't necessarily um, anticipate people deciding to push in front of you and literally just stand in front of you with no real questions asked, no real permission or nothing. And I guess for people who live in Berlin, it's probably different because they probably feel like a lot of tourists go there. So they feel like they're owed or they deserve the right to push in and go there because they live there, um, blah, blah, blah. But for me, I'm usually a calm dude. I'm usually a pretty easygoing guy. I don't like conflict, but if there's one thing that's that's always going to send me over the edge and make me go violent, it's when people decide that the rules don't apply for them and they decide that they just want to push in front of you because they want to push in front of you because you know i'm such a p u s s y if you would actually come up to me and say hey can i go in front because i live here i'd actually let you go in front you know what i mean i actually wouldn't say nothing but i just feel like the the arrogance to just walk in front not say anything and think it's completely cool is not on i've i've tapped many people on the shoulder very aggressively and told them to get to the back of the line because i don't think it's cool to be jumping in front of the queue so the last time i went i had a couple of queue jumpers i had to kind of aggressively tell to go to the back of the queue nothing too crazy but you know it kind of put me in a bad mood then you get to the front of the queue and i was with a couple of people in the queue that i was talking to a couple of guys who i knew deep down would wouldn't probably get in but they still were really sweet really cool dudes who just wanted to come and pass and a few other girls I was standing with and they all got rejected and then I got in and I was just really annoyed because I was like you know this whole selecting thing you know as great as it is it just kind of ruins people's nights because they're standing in the queue for hours they don't get told to leave you know in the queue because they're probably not going to get in they have to wait right until they get to the door and people just want to rave and I just felt the whole thing I just felt like it was all pretentious and just a bit of a performance and a bit extra and then when I went inside the club also the club didn't really feel that great or amazing to me I think it was the first time I realized it's just a club I think beforehand I put it on a bit of a pedestal but of course I didn't have myself to blame because who would go to Berghain Berlin so often anyway in a week in one year sorry calendar year and also who would only go to one club every time you go there you obviously have to visit other places so it was even it was one of the best things that happened the most recent time I went which might have been the fourth was when I went and I didn't go to Berghain at all I went to loads of other bars and pubs and clubs that I kind of hanged out. The kind of, you know, the one that stood out the most was obviously Same Heads because that reminded me a lot of the, you know, legendary nightclubs that we had here in London, in East London. And I had a really good time. But one thing that was true and that was kind of evident when I went to Same Heads was that I felt like that kind of energy from the old Grease Mueller, that kind of weirdo, um, queer, LGBTQ, Flinter, whatever that is, um, you know, energy that existed in those spaces was kind of there, right? And I also liked the fact that the age range was so varied. It wasn't just people under the age of 25 in, you know, latex and big stocky boots and flipping padlocks around their necks as necklaces. It was actually normal, everyday people who just maybe wanted to have a bit of a dance, have a bit of a boogie, do a couple of lines and go home. And that really did make my experience all the better. But Obviously, my home is still going to be Berghain. It's still going to be the place that, you know, kind of essentially opened up my chakras and got me involved in this flipping scene. But it is interesting and somewhat comforting to see other people in the scene who maybe live there, who maybe are more experienced than I am, maybe older, whatever it may be, who are echoing the same force I had. So I'm going to read a couple of these Reddit posts and then I'm going to send you guys on your way. So this is courtesy of Reddit. And it says here that the crowd is different from weekend to weekend. Two weeks ago, there was really a nice queer crowd. So everybody basically is complaining that there's not enough queer people in Berghain, which is pretty interesting. Um, but it makes a lot of sense also when you consider the foundation and the kind of origins of Berghain and who it kind of represented and what it was meant to be in terms of it being a quasi safe space. So it does make a lot of sense why a lot of the gays that go there would be a little bit upset that all the straights are basically impeding on their space. And it says another one says here, it can heavily depend on which DJ is playing but to the, I totally agree that after the Corona club has become that after Corona the club has become more and even more mainstream feeling and more generic crowd I also think that the entrance price and new drinks prices are going to make it make worse um, the person says here a 25 euro price tag is going to really exclude a lot of people in the LGBTQI plus audience quoting frequently and with drink prices going up 150% of their price um, a nighttime burn in 
Bergheim may be may only be affordable to some people once a month, even if the um, if even it depresses me that Bergheim was very very clearly moved into a mainstream capitalistic machine and it shows by the clientele and yes you can tell there are mixed reviews every weekend but i've gone to um the Berghain 25 plus times since it reopened and a couple hundred pre-corona and from my consistent experience i can tell you that it shifted a lot which is something that i said previously before i think i mentioned it that it was one of the first times i realized that the corona was real was when i went to Berghain just before corona spread i think it might have been like 2020 february or something and it was legitimately the first time that I was able to see the DJ beforehand I never saw the DJ it was always kind of you know stuck somewhere over there where you couldn't see them because all the bodies were densely packed in but that was the first time I saw them the first time I saw the space of the room I was able to move around and stuff it was pretty trippy to be there during that period of time but you definitely saw a vibe shift in the space anyway maybe that was a tribute to COVID because everyone was scared back then but I definitely saw the kind of the 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 early sprinklings of that vibe shift happening and then the price change has really been something a lot of people have been talking about that's really been getting people under people's skin because for the most part Bergheim might have been the first place I went to mega club like a super super club where you could go and actually legitimately buy a drink for under 10 euros that like you give the bartender a tenner and you get you know you get some change back you maybe give it to the bartender as a tip but you usually get some change back which is pretty cool but nowadays you go there and obviously you're paying, you know, as this person saying it was seven euros for a Corona before or for a sorry, Negroni and now it's 11 euros. And now I'm also hearing, which I'm not too sure if it's true because it's been debunked here and there from other places that the espresso martini is 18 euros, which is absolutely wild to think that you're paying that much. But the irony of it is it's still far cheaper than any um, club that you'd go to here in London, right? You're not going to be able to get, I don't think... Um, a cocktail like that anyway for that kind of price maybe you have to pay a little bit more the entry price being 25 euros is good too and the other really selling point that we don't get here in london is something that a lot of people don't take for granted over there is a re-entry a lot of clubs here in london or in the uk in general don't let you re-enter once you go in that's it and i guess it has to do with the early closing times we don't stay open until flipping Monday, but still the fact that you are able to go inside again, um, you know, obviously you have to pay if you want to re-enter and you can re-enter as many times as you want. It's pretty amazing. I think so. Um, it continues here. says, that's so, so funny. Do you say that? Because my friends and I went there the night before, uh, and left because the crowd was super hit hetero and all these dudes were aggressively pushing past on the front and after 1.5 hours we were still waiting to get in so we left and decided on the Berghain the next day and a friend of ours decided to wait and go in and just said the crowd was worse than it ever been so the person said what is happening in Berlin I mean blah, blah, blah. but the thing I like about it in this whole thread no one's actually saying where they're going instead a lot of people are basically saying they're not going there anymore when I went there recently a lot of people I bumped into and some old friends and whatnot were basically telling me that they don't go there ever which which was pretty interesting to see or to hear from them to say that so honestly so clearly people are going to other places but they're not mentioning where they're going which i think is good uh, you know i'm not a fan of gatekeeping but i think in this sense if you are somebody from the lgbtq plus you know scene or queer scene or gay scene whatever it may be you probably do owe it to yourself to keep those places close to your chest because clearly us straights have come and ransacked you know one of your flipping best clubs out there and turned it into a hetero showcase so the last thing you need for us to show up to another space that you basically deem to be home and absolutely ruin that so that doesn't make any sense it continues says as they're rotating in new bouncers um the crowds are becoming re really inconsistent sometimes the vibe is great sometimes it's off and that person says they're usually in the past 2018 to 19 sometimes so one to what three people max where i was like hmm the bouncer made a mistake yeah that's that's the same for me this time i felt like 40 or 50 percent of the crowd is badly chosen uh but it seems like yeah that, that's why i think nowadays if you get rejected from burger you should probably take it more as an offense because they let just about anybody in there nowadays. Um, it seems that Bergheim's getting desperate to make money. Straight girls can ensure entry if they wear swimsuits and fishnets, apparently. <laughs> Yawn. I used to see edgy people in there who were more convincing. Exactly. So you're seeing a lot more of that knacked kind of crew or people that are buying their flipping techno outfits from Amazon, which is pretty cringe if you're doing that in real life. But hey, who am I to judge? The repetitive... Oh, sorry. This is like watching Fashion Parade of people Googling how to get into Bergheim and then coming in 
into coming in what the internet told them to do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The repetitive looks were an issue even before the pandemic. Now it's probably worse, but even before, many of the guests stressed to conform. I was rejected the first time by a big tall woman, blah, 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 blah. Another person here says, if you follow the country and just sub regularly, you'll see that in any given club night, there will usually be a seamlessly contradictory description and varying assessments and the overall viable atmosphere. Everyone experiences of the Bergheim is different. You can have a very boring first eight hours and then meet a great group of people and finish with five of the best hours of your life. People often describe the door selection and crowd as hit and miss and sometimes um, lament that it isn't the same every week. One of the things that makes BH special for me is that for all its cons inconsistent, for all its consistencies, no photos, few rules and freedom, there are also inconsistencies that make each week different. It's not a bad thing that the crowd constitution is a bit unpredictable. Given the size of the place, there's always a possibility of meeting people, um, of being inside the people you want to meet. It's not like a 70 person venue where a few alpha bros heteros can take over the room. Definitely agree with that one. But, um, but yeah, it's just interesting to hear people complaining that it's not the most queer friendly, gay friendly place as it was before. Uh, another person here saying a global phenomenon happening to many historically gay, lesbian, queer public spaces post pandemic. COVID disruptions have maybe accelerated the gentrification patterns that were already occurring pre 2020. The last two times I went to Burger and I had gone, to, I had to go alone because many of my LGBT Berlin friends feel less safe there than they did in past years. Um, they mostly do private chills and kikis now, but also other gentrified parties, events that I won't name to help prevent those from being. Um, strategized as well i still have a great time there i may go alone but i'll never leave alone i always who oh, this guy's kinky i always make a new friend and not just the gay ones i do my thing regardless of the crowd but i understand why others may feel differently or unsafe i never had any sexual interest in other guys until my late 20s i grew up straight blood many many information bits is given there but anyway you get the point um i'd love to hear some of your opinions if you've actually been there and what you kind of feel um it's just interesting to be in a scenario now at the moment where it feels like the queer lgbtq gay folk in our scene are feeling as if they're being basically pushed out or they're being kind of you know pushed out of their own spaces the main thing they're even pushed out of club spaces pushed out of the spaces they've cultivated for them to feel safe they're now trying they're now being the other they've now being othered in these spaces and other people are coming in and basically taking over and mostly it's the straights they and they and, the, and i like how they blame the girls and the boys because i can just imagine if you're gay and you have you know super um energetic gay no super energetic straight guys and girls in your space it can really 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 upset the mood and not really add to the party in any meaningful way whatsoever so i definitely understand where they're coming from but i can't wait to go back myself <laughs> i'm always here all the time but for the most part i'm definitely going to branch out to different places like i always say but i'm definitely going to check out rso definitely going to check out club ost i'm definitely going to check out club division there which i've always got good memories of and a few other places too that i've seen pop up but in general it's nice to hear hear that my feelings and sentiments i had prior are being echoed by the wider public even though when i said what i said people were kind of throwing tomatoes at me but it's nice to hear we've all kind of arrived at the same place anyway that was the action Zing show episode number 620 thanks again for checking into the show if you want more information regarding myself you know what to do click the link below on my website actionzinger.com you can find all links regarding myself on there and for the people listening to the audio show you will hear my tune of the day and if you're watching the video portion of the show you will not hear my tune of the day and it'll just fade to black but thank you anyway for tuning in and i'll see you again very very soon bye